today's topic or this week's topic will be the regulated humidity and water vapor in thermal analysis. In detail, it's more or less the difference between humidity and water vapor in thermal analysis, what this presentation is more or less about. A little bit about myself. My name is Sebastian Seibt. I am the head of laboratory, the head of the application laboratory at Linzeis in Germany. I'm a chemist. I studied chemistry in the University of Bayreuth in Germany. I joined Linzeis in 2013, and I'm mainly responsible for dilatometer, thermogravimetry, and calorimetry. Uh, of course, the measurements, the service, trainings, and uh, instruments, demonstrations, and so on. If you want to get in touch with me, you can write me an email at s.site.linzeis.de, as you can see here, or you can anytime contact us directly via web page or on info at linzeis.de. For those of you who do not know the company yet, or who are interested more in the background of our company. Uh, Linzai Thermal Analysis, or the German name Linzai's Masquerade, uh, is a German family owned company. On the top left picture, you see our founder, Mr. Uh, Dr. Maximilian Linzai, uh, who founded the company in the year 1956 in northeast of Bavaria, right in the middle of Germany. And in the meantime, his son, Mr. Klaus Linzeis, is our, our owner, and his two sons, so the third generation, Mr. Florian Linzeis and Dr. Vincent Linzeis, are our CEOs and in the lead or leading the company at the moment. Meanwhile, we have uh, yeah, facilities in the US, in India, in China, where we have uh, laboratories for testing, for repair, and also service centers for sales and troubleshooting and so on. And we have our main facility here in Germany, uh, where we do the manufacturing, so where our yeah, instruments are more or less set up and built and developed, of course. In all the other countries where we do not have own yeah, facilities or own places or own companies, um, there are distributors, a lot of very good distributors who are representing us, who are selling our instruments, who can help you in case of uh, any trouble or problem, and they are in a good exchange with us as well. So. No matter where you are, you can get in touch with us if you want to. Our main business area is the manufacturing of instruments for thermal analysis. Besides that, thermal conductivity and also thermoelectric analysis. And of course, measurements in our service labs. On the picture down right, you see one of our labs here in Germany. It's the dilatometry lab or one, one part of the dilatometry lab. And what you see on the other picture is one of the data loggers that was the first product line the company began with. So this was not a, a thermal analysis, this was more or less data logging. It was a universal logger uh, that was developed for dilatometer. And this was the first product we produced in a bigger series, just that you know a little bit about the background. Nowadays, we do not long, no longer produce that stuff. We focused on thermal analysis since I would say 1990, meanwhile. Our product range, and this is where we start with our today's topic as well. As said, our product range uh, covers differential scanning calorimetry, so DEC, thermogravimetry, the combination of both simultaneous thermal analysis, which is the combination of DEC and TG, um, dilatometry for thermal expansion measurements, shrinkage, sintering, and thermomechanical analysis uh, like uh, TMA, and shortly TMA, which is a special uh, yeah, kind of dilatometry. We have um, thermal conductivity devices, like you can see here, laser flash techniques, thin film techniques for thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity. There are a lot of other techniques for thermal conductivity, like uh, heat flow meters and uh, uh, TIM testers, so trans interface material testers. We have analyzers for thermoelectrics, thin film wafers, whole effect. And then what makes us a little bit unique is we have a lot of customizations. That means uh, evolved gas analysis, high pressure modifications, high temperature modifications beyond 2000 centigrade, and so on. Uh, so this is our range. And as you can see, the line above here is written in bold letters uh, because uh, these instruments here, so DSC, TG, STA, dilatometer, TMA, these are the instruments that can be equipped in general or where it makes sense to be equipped with water vapor and humidity generators. So these instruments are what I'm talking about in the coming slides, uh, talking about humidity and so on. These are the instruments where this makes sense and where this is applicable. For thermal conductivity, thin film and so on, we did not yet lose uh, 
humidity generators and so on because here it's it's not requested and doesn't make sense or doesn't make too much sense so when i'm speaking about the possibility of adding water vapor humidity generators i'm speaking about the devices you can see in the upper row here just just for you to know that now back to our topic um as said the main intention of this little presentation here uh, is to show the difference between water vapor and humidity because there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of uh, yeah um, problems because uh, people are not always aware that there's a difference because there's a huge difference and what they can do with that kind of setup. So in general, um, we have to yeah, differ between humidity generators and water vapor generators. On the picture on the slide, you see how that looks like. Uh, I will go into detail in the further slides. So first of all, uh, there is a humidity generator. So relative humidity means an amount of water that is contained in an atmosphere below the boiling point of water. That means humidity is applicable in a range between room temperature and 100 centigrades. So whenever you speak about humidity or relative humidity, that is a kind of water that is carried by any kind of carrier gas or any kind of air atmosphere. So the water is more or less dissolved in a carrier gas or dissolved in air. And it's not really con so yeah, water steam or something. It's just little, little tiny water drops that are carried by the gas. So humidity always needs a carrier gas, needs a carrier atmosphere. And the concentration is very much depending on the temperature. I will explain that on the next slides. In contrast, water vapor means water that is in gaseous aggregate state. So water that has a temperature that is above 100 centigrades at ambient pressure. So above the boiling point of water. So speaking about water vapor always means you speak about water at temperatures at 100 degrees or higher. The biggest difference is that water vapor, pure water vapor can be used as an atmosphere without any carrier gas because pure water steam is also a gas. While Humidity is just liquid water in very, very nanoscale drops that is carried by a carrier gas or by an atmosphere. I will start explaining or handling the relative humidity first. We have the Linzai L40 relative humidity generator. It's called L40RH, um, but don't worry about the name. Uh, what I want to explain is how it works. As I said, the typical range for humidity is room temperature up to around 100 centigrades. With our humidity generator, you can do anything from room temperature up to 80 centigrades in the range between 80 and 100. It's a little bit tricky. It's still possible, but uh, with less concentrations. To define relative humidity, you have to know what it means. Relative humidity means the amount of water in grams that can be dissolved or that is dissolved in an amount of air or atmosphere or any gas in kilograms. So grams of water per kilogram of atmosphere is the grade of humidity. And now the, trick, the tricky thing is the maximum humidity level that can be within an atmosphere is dependent on the temperature. It's the so-called capacity. On this scheme here, you see the relative capacity, how much water any gas can carry depends on the temperature of the gas. The same amount of water at 10 degrees, maybe 100% relative humidity at the saturation level, but the same amount is only 50% relative humidity, maybe at 20 degrees, and only 28% relative humidity at 30 degrees, as the capacity of the atmosphere to carry water increases by temperature. So to keep the humidity level constant in increasing temperature ranges, you have to add more water, or you have to reduce the volume somehow. Of course, it makes more sense to add more water. But this is why it's so tricky to keep a relative humidity level constant. And it's easier to just calculate what the relative humidity changes if the temperature changes. But that's the, that's the critical point you have to know. So the percentage of relative humidity is very much depending on the capacity at any given temperature. This requires, of course, a dynamic control. As I said, if you want to keep the level constant, you need to constantly pump water in or you have to exactly monitor your temperature of your gas to calculate the actual humidity percentage. That also means the one point that very, very few people are aware of, if you have a system that operates in humidity and that cools down, that means that the capacity will decrease. And whenever you reach 100% capacity and go below that, the water will condense. So you 
exceed the dew point of the water and the water will condensate. So you have condensing water all over the place and that's what you need to avoid. And that's what makes it a little bit more tricky than it may look like. As said, the dew point of water is also changing. So the capacity and the dew point are shifting by temperature. And this slide just shows the water concentration uh, versus temperature and the dew point at different humidity levels. What this also shows, so it's the water vapor concentration versus temperature at different humidity levels. You see at 100% humidity, you need much more water at, and increasing by temperature, it's dramatically increasing. While you, if you want to keep a low level of humidity uh, constant, you need much less water. And if you just imagine the blue curve and extrapolate the blue curve up to 100 degrees, you can imagine that it's really a huge amount of water needed to keep the 100% all up and, and running. And therefore our humidity generator can guarantee 80% up to 100 degrees. Uh, it can guarantee 100% humidity up to 80 degrees. That's what I meant at the beginning. What you can also see on the slide, if you go close to room, uh, zero or if you go lower than zero, the relative humidity curves all go down to almost close to zero. At around minus 20 centigrade, they are actually zero. That means if you cool down to minus 20, you cannot create humidity anymore because water will immediately freeze and fall out. Therefore, between zero and minus 20, it's very, very tiny amounts of water that are not a possible to be controlled. So that's the reason why below zero, we cannot create humidity. And be below 20 centigrade, it's even not physically possible to create humidity. That's why cold air is always dry air. And in the winter, it's always dry air. People are complaining about that almost every time. So in the winter, it's really dry air. In summer month, when it's warm, it's so-called wet air. And this is what you need to know. So below zero, no humidity possible. Between zero and maybe five or 10, it's very difficult to set humidity because it's very tiny amount of waters. And higher than 80 degrees, it's very much water to reach the 100%. And as said, higher than 100 centigrade, we are speaking about water vapor. From the application side, humidity is a very common application. Um, this gene shows that human beings and animals have a comfort zone. <laughs> that sounds strange and funny in the first uh, first sentence, but if you have a closer look, what this uh, gene uh, wants you to show is in a very narrow temperature range between around 15 centigrade and 25 centigrade, human life and animal life on Earth feels comfortable. But not only the temperature determines the level where our daily life takes place, also the relative humidity. Most organic life forms need a humidity level between 20% and 80% relative humidity. We cannot live in pure water and too wet air, and we cannot exist if it's too dry for a longer time. So therefore we have this comfort zone where life is uh, taking place and where our ambient uh, yeah, conditions are usually. Of course, there are countries where it's hotter, where it's a little bit colder, but the relative humidity level is usually in that range. In our houses, in our flats where we live, this is, this is the condition. So these are the conditions that we usually have. This is interesting because in thermal analysis, a lot of people investigate materials like plastics, glasses, ceramics, whatever, for daily use, for cars, for interior, and for many, many applications. And they always consider the temperature range that these materials may face, and they check what happens if they are cold, what happens if they are hot, what happens, how they decompose and so on. But what very few people consider is usually there's not dry air like in an, in an experiment where we use dry atmosphere, defined atmosphere. Usually there is a certain level of humidity. And that's why you should consider this and where you should use ambient air wherever possible because ambient air already contains humidity and not dry gases. And if you use dry gases, think about if it wouldn't make sense to use also wet gases for just simulate real life conditions. This is a setup of our humidity generator as a schematic um, that you can just understand how it works. So um, as said, the big difference between humidity generators and water vapor generators is that the humidity generator always needs an atmosphere that is filled more or less with water. So it cannot fill pure water in. What you see is, I'm sorry about the, the bad uh, letters here. I will just read it for you. So you have a dry gas that goes through a filter. Then you have a pressure regulator and more or less a flow meter. And then you go to a split 
box. So this is all, by the way, this is all within this box here. So in the background, you just add a dry gas. The dry gas is uh, yeah, split into two lines. One line has a valve and an MHC, the other one as well. And the one line just goes to the outlet valve here. The other line goes to the evaporator and the evaporator is connected with a water reservoir. And this water reservoir pumps some water to the evaporator and evaporates the water into this dry gas or this, this carrier gas flow here. And then the dry gas that is bypassed here and the dry gas that's using the water are mixed up. These two MFC blocks here can control the, the, yeah, the relation between wet gas and dry gas and so can mix up any amount of water vapor here, more or less, or uh, yeah, humidity in that case. And then you create a wet gas at that point. This wet gas goes through a dew point analyzer. So there is a sensor that actually measures the temperature of the gas and it also measures the saturation of humidity. So this little box shows you the temperature of your gas and also the humidity level. And then it has a yeah, more or less bypass valve to get rid of the water if there's condensing water. And it has a valve that goes into a heated transfer line that comes out of this box. So here we are getting out of the box. So out of the box, you have a heat transfer line that goes into a thermal analysis instrument or wherever you want to use that controlled humidity gas. This is what this humidity generator does. So as said, you can use any dry gas. It can be oxygen, air, nitrogen, whatever. This is, of course, water. It's mixed up. It's controlled. And you can create levels from 0 to 100% humidity at any given temperature between room temperature and 80 degrees. Uh, with some limits also between 80 and 100. And this prepared gas goes at a constant temperature into your instrument. So this is how we create humidity atmospheres. These are the pure specs of this instrument. So we can create flow rates between 500 uh, milliliters per minute up to 15,000 milliliters per minute maximum. We can generate humidity ranges of 2% up to 98% over the whole range, more or less. As said, room temperature to 80 degrees, with a little bit reduction of the maximum value also up to 100. And the tolerance level, and yeah, that's the most important thing is plus minus 1% relative humidity due to some temperature uh, fluctuations maybe and due to some gas flow yeah, fluctuations. So it's around 1% accuracy. And what's also important, the whole setup comes with a humidity sensor and can analyze dew point and temperature and it knows how much humidity is pumped in. And this sensor has also the same accuracy uh, of mon minus plus minus one percent, like in the tolerance range. So this is what our humidity generator can do. As said, it can be equipped at a thermal balance, DSC, dilatometer, thermal mechanical analyzer. So the the product range, the upper row that I just showed you, I go just back some slides that I remember you. They can all equipped at this instrument series. I'm telling this because I want to show you some applications now. Um, the main applications for relative humidity are either you do a temperature sweep, so you create a defined level of humidity, you set it, and then the chamber is heated. The amount of water stays constant, therefore the humidity level changes, like I explained in the beginning. Or you can also do an isothermal experiment, you go to a certain temperature, you keep the temperature all the time, and then you increase or vary the humidity. So a raw different experience uh, is of course also possible to so go to one temperature step, vary the humidity, go to the next temperature step, vary the humidity and so on. So this would also be possible. And this is what most people do. What would be possible, but what is very difficult is to increase temperature and try to keep the humidity level constant because this would require always to pump more and more water in that, that can be done. However, during cooling that always leads to condensation of the water. And that means uh, a lot of liquid water in the instrument, which is not so good. I also have some measurements here from customers from us that did measurements with humidity generators. Um, that was a customer that was who was analyzing wall brick samples. So on the left side, you see the moisture content that was measured by a thermogravimetric analyzer. So relative humidity versus moisture content at two different brick, uh, yeah, brick variants at one time 20 degrees and one time 60 degrees. So the brick sample was heated to 20 and 60 degrees, kept at that temperature, and humidity was increased. 
So from a level of zero up to a level of 100%. So please excuse, this is a percentage level that means 0%, 100%. And as you see, the blue brick significantly takes up less humidity, so it's less porous. So the humidity level within the brick is lower, the mass increase is lower, and it dramatically increases when it's getting really wet, when the water is almost liquid at the high level. The same for the, yeah, for the red line and the yellow line for the other brick. This brick is more porous, it takes up much more humidity. And as you can see, both samples show the difference between 20 degrees and 60 degrees. The same here. At 60 degrees, the capacity to take up humidity of the sample was much bigger. On the right side, it's another two uh, brick samples. And now they're also at 20 and 60 degrees, but now they were uh, investigated uh, regarding their expansion coefficient. And here what's interesting, uh, the range was only from zero to 25% relative humidity, but you can see when there is no humidity, the coefficient of thermal expansion is significantly higher than if the, if the wall of the brick is wet. If it's completely dry, the expansion coefficient is much higher than if it, it's a wet sample of the sample is wet. So this was what this customer was investigating, and it shows a significant difference between wet and dry samples and also dependency on the level of humidity. I don't know what kind of conclusions these people uh, yeah, took out of these measurements, but just to show you what people are doing with that kind of setup. We had another customer who was investigating foods. So he used the DSC instrument. A DSC measures the calorimetric signal. So you can measure phase transitions, glass transitions, melting point, and so on. And this customer was investigating uh, the lifetime and the uh, yeah, storage times of uh, some sugar samples. In that case, it was a sucrose sugar. And this sugar was investigated at different humidity levels by DSC. The upper curves were recorded during heating. The lower curves was, were recorded during cooling. And what these guys did was a lot of experiments. I just want to show one of them. So they used different levels of uh, humidity. So 0%, 3.5, 20, and 25%. And they investigated the crystalline behavior of their sugars and the shift of the glass transition. Why at no or almost no humidity, the glass transition is where it's expected to be and where the literature value says it is. So it's around 60 degrees. And with a little bit of humidity, it's around 30 degrees. So that's the range where it's, uh, according to the literature, um, you have to know sugars and foods always carry a little bit of humidity. They are never completely dry. So they are crystalline, but they contain already a little bit of humidity. So the 3.5% value might be the yeah, real life reality if you store it into your kitchen or somewhere. Um, you can see that if it's really wet, if the atmosphere is wet 20, 25, 30%, uh, water content in the sugar, you see that the glass transition is dramatically shifted into the negative range. So it's no longer really crystalline. It's already over the glass transition. So it is crystalline, but um, the glass transition is already gone because then it's in the negative range. So humidity can have a significant influence on the behavior, on the structure of foods, um, not only sugars, but also more complex stuff where sugar is contained, where other proteins and, and other stuff are contained. Um, on the one hand, it's because of some, yeah, some mushrooms that can grow there or some, some bacteria that might grow if it's too wet. And, but on the other hand, it's also the shape and the taste that can be influenced by humidity levels. And this is quite interesting. And this is what these customers are doing with their DEC with humidity generator. Uh, if they are watching, thank you for uh, giving us this data and giving us a little, yeah, short overview of what you are doing with our instruments. I have a third one, and uh, this is a polymer manufacturer who bought one of our instruments. He was also using a gravimet thermogravimetric analyzer, so a TGA, and he was uh, investigating the diffusion in a polymer sample, so the water content of a polymer samples at different temperatures at different humidity levels. Um, the humidity level, so started at zero, was increased. The temperature was increased also with the humidity, and what you can see is the mass change. At different temperatures, we see 20, 40, 60, 80, 85 degrees. You can see the colors here, um, indicate the curves. And what you can see is at 85 centigrade, with the high level of humidity, the mass uptake is much bigger than at low percentage of humidity and at lower temperatures. Sorry, at lower temperatures at the same uh, humidity level. 
So what you can see, there is a temperature dependent uptake of humidity and uptake of water for some polymers that may come with some aging problems and some uh, structural changes. So just imagine you have toys and your, your children uh, may play with them and they get wet, they have wet fingers, whatever. It would be not so good if toys suddenly get soft or if your, if your little bricks suddenly get soft and your little house they just build uh, <laughs> falls down or decomposes because the polymer cannot withstand the humidity they have on their fingers. So this is very interesting for quality control, also for asset manufacturers of polymers, also for other building materials and yeah, materials for our daily life. Just to give you a little impression what our customers are doing with this kind of equipment. On the other hand, now to, to close the humidity um, topic, as said, we are now in the comparison with water vapor. Water vapor is much easier to apply and much easier to handle. And this is what most people are interested in if they are really doing thermal analysis, because as said, if you're working at temperature ranges higher than 100 centigrade, you're not speaking about humidity, you're now speaking about water vapor. That means water, of course, is in its gaseous aggregate state if you go higher than 100 centigrade. It can only exist as steam or as gas if you exceed the boiling point. At ambient pressure, of course, it's 100 centigrade. If you have elevated pressure, you can see the diagram over here. If you are at elevated pressure, the boiling point increases. So to boil water at elevated pressure needs more energy. So therefore you need higher temperatures. The blue line down here, determines the borderline or the yeah, more or less the borderline between liquid water, solid water and gaseous water at different temperatures. Whenever you have pressure that is lower than the pressure the blue line shows and the temperature that's needed here, you have gaseous water. That's a so-called triple point where liquid, solid and gaseous phase are close to each other. And here it's possible to directly go from solid to gaseous. Um, and there is the critical point that means if you have high temperatures and you exceed the pressure level of the critical point you're getting in the overcritical area where water only exists as a mixture or more or less a mixture of liquids and gas that cannot be defined anymore. It behaves not like a liquid, it behaves not like a gas. It's a yeah, highly or high density gas that looks like a fog or look like, looks like a white cloud, something like that. So uh, it's very hard to handle it here. But whenever you are in that temperature range here, water is gaseous, and then you can use it as water steam, as water vapor. The picture here shows how a water vapor generator more or less looks like, and this is how it works. Um, the picture down here shows a uh, Linsize STA instrument, so a thermogravimetric instrument with DSC sensor also um, connected to a water vapor generator, and there's also a vacuum pump here for evacuating the atmosphere before filling with water vapor. The water vapor generator is much easier to handle and much easier to set up. As I said, basically you have a water reservoir, you have a pump, you have an MFC block, and this goes into yeah, an evaporator um, that goes into a heated transfer line and that goes into your instrument. Sounds simple, and it is simple. You just evaporate water and pump in the steam. You have a flow control here, how much steam you pump in, and you can use it as a pure sample gas without any need of a carrier gas. If you want to have a low amount of water vapor, of course you can use a carrier gas. Therefore, we have this MFC control. Standard equipment would be up to three gases, one perch gas, two sample gases. The perch gas can be bypassed and directly used as a perch gas. The sample gases can also be bypassed and directly put in the instrument, but the sample gases can also be mixed up in any concentrations with the water steam and then put in together with the water steam as a mixture of water and dry gases. But as said, the main difference to the humidity generator is you can use water vapor as a pure gas in here. In the STA instrument, yeah, of course, there's a gas outlet, there is a controlled gas outlet. And in case of you want to couple your gas outlet to a mass spec, to FTA, of course, you can also have a split valve on top here. You can have an alternative gas outlet where you can go into another analyzer. It's not shown here. This is not an MS, this is just a vacuum pump, just for you to know. And this is the whole setup for yeah, a water vapor generator. To be honest with you, 
The water vapor generator is an easy setup that we do by ourselves. So we buy this HPLC pump here, we modify, we set up the gas flow lines and so on, while the humidity generator is bought as a whole part from one of our suppliers. The specs of the water vapor generator can vary as we do it by ourselves and we can equip it with different MFCs. So in general, we can have flow rates of 10 milliliters per minute up to 500 milliliters per minute pure steam. That can be increased if it's not pure steam. So 500 milliliters per minute pure water steam is what we can do. If you want to add some other gases, you want to mix up with other gases, you can have much higher flow rates of the other gas, of course, but five milliliters per minute water, uh, 500 milliliters per water per minute is what's the limit. It enables us to get water concentrations and water steam concentrations. Please do not mix that up with humidity levels. This is a water steam concentration of one to 100% water vapor. It's not humidity as relative humidity is no longer defined if the boiling point is exceeded. Please keep that in mind. The temperature range we can apply this is as said, 100 centigrades up to 1600 centigrades. Again, I wanna be honest with you here, 100 is the real lower limit. I would say 120 up to 1600 to be fair with you. The tolerance level of the accuracy of water concentration is also plus minus 1% water vapor. And the main difference is also, we do not have any sensor to determine the, the water vapor inside. If you want to calculate how much percentage you have, you have to calculate carefully the gas flow and the gas stream of your dry gas and wet gas. If you start with a certain dry and wet gas mixture and you, you change the mixture during the experience, you have to think about what's in the chamber, how much volume the chamber has, and so on and so on. So it's a little bit calculations, a little bit math you have to do. So there are no sensors available here as humidity is not defined. Again, some applications where water vapor comes into play and where it's used. Um, water vapor generators are also used with dilatometers, but they are mainly used in thermobalancers and DSC instruments. I had one application for dilatometer here, but most people who are really using water vapor um, are doing really reactions. No, no simulation of, of some yeah, material or stability or aging of material at real life conditions. Water vapor is mainly used um, yeah, really for reactions, decompositions and other stuff. Therefore, most people who use that have applications in the high pressure range. They use thermal balances, but they also use very frequently high pressure STA. So this is our high pressure STA or the smaller version, the STA high pressure number three, uh, which is a tabletop pressurized instrument up to 50 bar. So these are the instruments where the water vapor generator we sell are used mostly. Um, I have one typical application I want to show you. The typical and classical water vapor application that we mainly sell and where we have most experience is the yeah, gasification of coal or biomass samples. If you want to access carbon that's bound into biomass or carbon from charcoal, you can access it by using water vapor adding to a coal sample. There will be a reaction that's shown at the red, uh, in red here at the side. The carbon will react at elevated temperatures and elevated pressures with water and form carbon monoxide and hydrogen. This reaction under pressure and elevated temperature is done in many reactors to create hydrogen out of biomass, to create hydrogen out of coal, out of anything that contains carbon. People who are doing research are often or very, very frequently interested in how much carbon and how much hydrogen content they can get out of their type of sample. And therefore the setup is always similar. What they do is, so this is a little bit confusing, so I'll explain. First of all, they put a sample into the reactor, or if they want to simulate that, they put it into a thermal balance. Within the thermal balance, the sample is heated to a target temperature. Maybe it's also heated uh, to a target temperature and it's pressurized. In that application example, it was kept at the target temperature and then it was pressurized to a certain pressure level, at that case, 50 bars. So it was heated to a temperature and then it was at around 50 bars. There was purge gas flowing all the time, which is the purple curve. The green curve is just the pressure indicator. What was measured was the mass change. So the sample was heated under inert atmosphere. And here you saw a little mass change. You lost some volatiles. Then it was further on heated to target temperature. The mass was stable. 
somewhere here, the target temperature was reached. And then the inert gas atmosphere was changed or was yeah, exchanged into a water vapor atmosphere. After at some pressure at some temperature, the water vapor was reaching the cold containing sample, you see a sudden mass loss. There was a huge mass loss starting after the water was added. And the mass loss went on, went on, went on, went on until it stopped here, which was the point where 100% of the sample was gasified or 100% of the carbon that was contained in the sample was gasified. So this mass loss means the water vapor had reacted with the carbon forming hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and here the reaction stopped. The use of this reaction is that you, you cannot only get carbon monoxide and hydrogen, you can also have secondary and third reactions following forming methane gas, forming alcohols, forming olefines, so uh, carbohydrates, and forming carbon dioxide. So if you add another water molecule to this, to carbon monoxide and hydrogen, you get even more hydrogen and you get carbon dioxide. So finally, out of this principal reaction and principal setup, you can get yeah, forming gas, generation gas, you can get hydrogen, you can get access to your bound carbon, and you can use your biomass that way to technically create hydrogen, methane, and other useful gases that you can use for other processes. And this application, as said, is done in many ways. We had a lot of customers who were uh, investigating the use of um, biomass that was a waste out of production of palm oil, out of production of some fruits and so on. Um, they were trying to somehow get uh, worth or get use out of the, of the waste material. Of course, we had also charcoal manufacturers who want to investigate how many charcoal and how many residues you have. This is also a good process to monitor this. And this is the most yeah, asked application for the real water vapor generator. There are some more examples I'm not allowed to show here and that do not want to show uh, because this is, I think, uh, about half an hour, about 40 minutes presentation now. As said, the goal of this presentation was to show you the huge difference between water vapor and humidity generator, where they can be used, where they are used from our customers, and to get you familiar with that kind of setup. At that point, I want to close this talk. I want to thank you for your attention, 